Hey there. Thanks so much for joining us for the Life Support Podcast. It's where we talk to providers, community members, experts, and others about their experiences with health and the systems that create it. All right, Jen, where are we? We are in Boise, Idaho. It's been a long week. We've been traveling since Monday and... Yeah, we're in Boise, Idaho at the CFHA conference. Awesome. And and we're being um, not great conference attendees, even <laughs> though um, there's a really good plenary session going on. We decided to take a quiet moment um, out in the other rooms and come talk a little bit about um, some of the conversations we've been having lately. Mm-hmm. And I think that that really ties into our first conversation with um, Dr. Dr. Walters. Um, so when we talked with Dr. Walters, we talked a lot about um, the role of the clinical psychologist and what that means for managing health conditions. So what do you, what do you think most people think about the role of a clinical psychologist? Like what, when they hear that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I don't even know if I said it during our conversation, but a lot of people think, oh, head doctor, I don't need a head doctor. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I don't think they really even know what a head doctor quote unquote does, mm-hmm. right? So right. it was very eye-opening to hear her responses to us. Yeah. And then tying it all with, how the health of a person, whether it be diabetes or whatever, also plays with your mental health, right? Mm-hmm. So it was an interesting conversation with her. Yeah, and it, I think it makes total sense that the clinical psychologist should be part of that chronic disease care, mm-hmm. um, but it, I think that it's also pretty novel. So it's right. interesting to hear her talk about that being her full-time job and that she serves, you know, one disease population, right. um, but that uh, not a lot of people know about it. Exactly. Um, so I, that was great to hear. What What do you think about um, the implications for like this model in underserved communities? Because we're, we're here in Boise and m- many people listening may not think of Boise as like a big urban center, but right. we're in the middle of skyscrapers. Right. There's a couple um, out of the fields of potatoes. No, <laughs> People from Idaho, I, 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 I apologize <laughs> for that, um, but but you knew it was coming. Uh, no, but but Boise is a big population center, and that's where Dr. Walters practices. Mm-hmm. And so, um, one of the things I was thinking yeah. while we're having that conversation is this is super cool that there's a specialty clinic for diabetes care where people can go right. and get um, uh, that type of team based care support, mm-hmm. but. What about somebody who lives two hours away? Right. What does that mean for them? Right. It, it does impact them, right? Like being able to just have everything. I mean, that's one of the things I think I even said it, like I look for. Mm-hmm. And, you know, being outside of Boston, it's easily, readily available to have all the type of specialties that I need, mm-hmm. right? Um, when you're looking at two hours away from a pretty big city, right? Mm-hmm. It's a, Boise is pretty nice. We've got two big universities here, so... Having to, you know, travel that distance to get the right type of care, and it just makes it a lot difficult. So, being able, having people like her and others that can provide multiple care, uh, multiple specialties in one office, especially something like mental health and um, and primary care, it's amazing, and they're doing a great job. And I think more and more places are trying to do this. So yeah, that's important. Mm-hmm. I think we just did the see who thing where we said, that's a cool model. How can we make it easier to get to and better? Right. So that's exactly. perfect. Yeah. Um, so with that, enjoy our conversation with Dr. Walters. So today we're talking with Amy. Amy, can you introduce yourself? So your name, where you live, what you do when you're not working first, and then what you do professionally? Absolutely. So my name is Amy Walters and I live in Meridian, Idaho. I'm an Idaho native. So when I'm not working, I love to be spending time outdoors, love to do backpacking, um, hiking, spending time with my family and my dog, just enjoying the great Idaho outdoors. Um, Professionally, I'm a licensed psychologist and I currently direct an integrated behavioral health program for St. Luke's Humphreys Diabetes Center. And then I also work as a clinical consultant um, with CHU. Awesome. So yeah, Amy, what does a clinical psychologist do exactly? 
Yeah, traditionally, so clinical psychologists are doctorally trained providers who evaluate and treat mental health conditions, but they also have extensive training in human behavior, learning, um, motivation, and their jobs really vary depending on different settings. So we work in a lot of different settings, um, including healthcare. Perfect. That's, that's a lot. And you mentioned that you specifically work around diabetes. So I know that clinical psychologists can focus in different areas, but um, I think your story is super interesting about kind of the intersection between your work with diabetes and some lived experience. Can you tell the story of how you came to work in diabetes and how that ultimately intersected with your family life in a very real way? Absolutely. I'd be happy to share that. So I um, met a nurse by the name of Don Scott, who ran a diabetes camp up in the Sotheby's Mountains of Idaho. And he was looking for a mental health provider to be able to be a volunteer on staff um, in the summers and support kids with diabetes kind of in their journey for improving their self-care um, and learning to just live in a healthy way with their diabetes. So I was, you know, avid outdoor person and really um, took advantage of the opportunity absolutely fell in love uh, with this group, Idaho Diabetes Youth Programs, who continues to work today and provide a number of different camping programs now for kids and teens with diabetes, Um, but was just really struck by the intersection of how important the psychosocial factors were in diabetes management, just how intensive um, the demands were for self-care, and really the impact um, that coping and stress have on diabetes management. So I spent a number of summers um, going up to the Sawtooth for a week and and working with these kids at this diabetes camp. A few years later, I actually had my own kids. So I had twins. And about the time that my twins were turning one, um, one of them started just struggling a little bit with her health. She was having a lot of fatigue. She uh, was wetting through her diapers. She was thirsty all the time. And because of my experience at diabetes camp, I was like, oh my gosh, this, I'm worried that this baby is developing diabetes. So I went to my local pediatrician and I said, yeah, I'm really concerned about this. And she said, oh no, you know, I think, you know, you moms, you always worry. And then it's probably just a cold. Um, but they did go ahead and um, check her blood sugars. And sure enough, they were through the roof. And so after um, having this experience with camp, ended up with a baby with type one diabetes. So um, not only have I had you know, this great um, clinical experience in, in kind of working with kids with diabetes, it also really impacted my family. And so um, shifted my career and started working more with people with diabetes and was able to develop this integrated behavioral health program through Humphreys Diabetes Center. That's really amazing just how uh, those paths intersected. And uh, I know you've said uh, that that was a really early diagnosis for diabetes. So certainly um, mom's instinct plus some of your experience at play there, right? Absolutely. And just so, you know, felt incredibly fortunate um, that I had had that background and we were able to get her treatment very early on before she came, became critically ill, which, which happens to a lot of kids with type one diabetes. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to circle back a little bit to the intersection between diabetes and clinical psychology. You mentioned some words um, around diabetes management and kind of the psychosocial component. Can you break that down for us just a little bit and talk about how mental health and diabetes really do intersect? You know, so the first thing we, when we talk about diabetes, we use kind of the general term diabetes, but there are really two different conditions that we talk about. One is type one diabetes, um, which is an autoimmune disease. And the other is type two diabetes, which is a metabolic disease. But in both these conditions, they really require a great deal of behavior and lifestyle change. Um, and so these are significant factors that can impact people. They often know that they need to make change, but they struggle to make that change. And so having some support in this area can be incredibly valuable. Um, Um, One of the things that I ran into when I was working through the camps, I'd actually had a private practice at the time, and I would get referrals for kids from camp to to come and see me who were just struggling with their diabetes management. Um, And oftentimes, you know, people would get a referral, but then they wouldn't show up. And and if I would talk to them later at camp, um, kids would often say, well, you know, I I, I just have diabetes. I don't, I'm not crazy. I don't need to talk to a shrink. So there was this total disconnect between um, having this chronic condition and needing that support versus um, having a mental health condition. So just people who are coping with chronic disease struggle with a lot of stress. They struggle to cope with their condition. They struggle to make these behavior changes. And there's also a great deal of grief and loss that goes along with chronic disease management. And all of those are things that uh, psychologists or other mental health professionals can be really useful in supporting. 
Yeah, I think a lot of people just think like, oh, you know, I don't want to see a head doctor because then there's a stigma around that, right? And not everybody's open to that. So I guess, how do you work as a part of a care team to manage patients' needs, especially when there's like that I, that disconnect of what how it could really help them? Yeah, absolutely. So just being a part of the care team can be really helpful. As I mentioned, we run an integrated behavioral health program at the St. Luke's Humphreys Diabetes Center. So the idea is behavioral health is just part of that greater care team. So we have, uh, you know, certified diabetes educators who are nurses and dietitians. We have endocrinologists and pharmacists on our team, um, and we have behavioral health providers. And the idea is we can address all of your needs and treat the whole person with diabetes. So being there right on site, being able to meet with patients uh, with their other medical providers really helps um, open up kind of access to services and really helps reduce some of that stigma because it's just presented as part of good diabetes management. Yeah, I really like when I go to a practice that actually has everything that I need all in one spot or has the resources somewhat available um, to reach out to. I guess my other question would be, how do you, um, like if there was one thing or three things that you would want, you know, a patient or medical providers to know about behavioral health and diabetes, what would those, you know, one to three things be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so the first one is just that successful diagno- uh, you know, adjustment to diagnosis it, is all about change, changing in behavior, dealing with changes in emotions, dealing with some of the changes that occur socially when you're trying to make lifestyle change. And oftentimes people know that they need to make that change, but they really struggle to do it. So getting some support from somebody who has um, professional training in that area can be really helpful. Um, the second point would be that having a chronic condition is incredibly stressful. And we know that stress has a negative impact on diabetes management. When people are in um, a state of stress, their body releases stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, and those hormones can actually cause an increase in glucose levels. So having great stress management strategies, because stress is just part of daily life, but knowing kind of what to do and how to do it and having some ideas and some perks you can work with to address that can be really helpful. Um, The third thing that I think is important for, for people to know is just that we actually see much higher rates of depression and anxiety among people who have diabetes. Um, the prevalence is, is, is almost double what it is in the regular population. And, and so anywhere from like 20 to 40% of people with diabetes will report significant symptoms of depression or anxiety. And these can really have a negative impact on quality of life as well as their ability to just manage their disease. So ha- uh, being able to work with someone who can assess and treat those issues is really important for overall care and just better benefits of overall health. That's super interesting. And um, thinking about, again, from somebody's perspective who might, you know, be struggling with managing their diabetes. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that sometimes you get that self-perpetuating cycle of my stress is making my diabetes worse. And I, I almost think about it like somebody who's thinking about how, how they can't sleep and that's making their insomnia worse. Right. right, um, right. So, so what do you, what do you think about um, the best I guess, a mindset or approach for somebody that might be struggling in that way. So one is just normalizing it, recognizing uh, that, you know, life is stressful. We've certainly been through a number of difficult events in in the last couple of years um, with the pandemic and and life has changed and there have been a number of stressors. So helping people recognize that this is a really normal phenomenon and that managing a chronic condition adds a whole nother layer of stress. So starting to help people kind of unpack where is your stress coming from? What are the contributing factors? And what are some things that we can do about that? And then teaching them some kind of basic coping skills to be able to stay calm both physically um, and mentally. Perfect. And then I I think, um, again, think about kind of that feedback uh, cycle. I I think also about how um, stress over the kind of physical manifestation of diabetes and your own health can um, impact, you know, your blood sugars and um, your cardiovascular health. Um, How does some of this translate from diabetes to other chronic disease management? Yeah, so we do see the same phenomenon uh, with other chronic conditions. And oftentimes people with diabetes do have other co-occurring conditions. They may have cardiovascular disease, uh, sometimes see people struggling with chronic pain. So we work hard to you know, support people in making lifestyle changes that will support all of their conditions. Um, and then learning to just deal with some of the challenges associated with management of those conditions. 
One of the questions that I have, um, Amy, is really around as a part of the care team, what does your day look like as a clinical psychologist? It seems like there's so much that you could be doing with every single patient, regardless of their needs. Um, what, what does it look like for you as you're supporting patients in the clinic where you work? Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, um, I do work as part of a care team and so often um, meet with that team to collaborate and um, discuss patient care, discuss ways to, to best support the psychosocial needs um, of our patients. We sometimes do um, team in-service training on different psychosocial issues to help make sure that we're upskilling um, our providers and our CDEs so that they've got great awareness of psychosocial factors and how they may be impacting diabetes management. Um, I do a lot of direct clinical work during my day. So uh, that would consist of working with new patients. Um, sometimes that occurs in a warm handoff where I may have a provider that calls me uh, into the office with them. So I'm in the exam room and meeting with an individual and talking with them a little bit. Sometimes I'm able to provide just a brief consultation to discuss um, some ideas for ways to improve whatever it is that they might be struggling with. Um, other times I may have somebody come in and, and do a full assessment. So meeting with them, doing an interview, learning a little bit more about them, um, about their life, about their challenges, about their diabetes management, doing some basic screenings for anxiety and depression, and then really help to develop a plan of care to identify some, you know, what are the needs that are there? What are some of the challenges? And what are some things that we can do together to help improve that? I then meet with people on a short-term basis for follow-up. So we do short-term therapy, usually 30-minute sessions, sometimes a little bit longer than that, uh, to try to build some skills in those different areas. So that's a, what the majority of my day looks like. Sometimes I'll run Groups. So in the past, we've actually done uh, what was called a walk and talk group. This was a way to help provide just some general information about health and health behavior change, and then also combine that um, with some physical activity. For many people, getting started is the hardest part. So having um, a group that they could go to once a week where they could get some information and then take a walk uh, with other people who are in the same position was, was really helpful. So lots of direct patient care, um, and then also some training, and, and also have done some presentations here and there on motivation interviewing or psychosocial factors uh, that impact health. Again, just trying to spread that information and that knowledge base. So when I, I hear you talking about kind of the support that you're able to offer to patients and providers, um, it, it seems like that can just make a huge difference in disease management and quality of life. And I also think about the fact that the entire state of Idaho and many um, parts of the country are mental health provider shortage areas. For those uh, clinics or communities that don't have great access um, to the expertise of like a clinical psychologist, are there other ways to help support that element of disease management specific to diabetes and to other chronic diseases? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, having um, just a mental health provider is valuable. So it doesn't have to be a clinical psychologist. It could also be a clinical social worker. It could be um, a licensed professional counselor. So having some kind of access to mental health support can, can be just incredibly valuable. Um, I will say that, you know, one of the, the few good things that COVID brought us um, was an increase in telehealth services. And that's really opened up a lot of opportunity um, within mental health. We now have people who can provide you know, um, services directly through telehealth, whether it's through video, which is optimal, or sometimes even telephone, but it's really given us better opportunity to provide that support in some of our rural communities where people before would have to travel long distances and not really have access. So I think that's one thing that clinics can look for is, you know, if they don't have their own uh, providers within their community, can they connect with other people within their state to be able to provide some ongoing behavioral health support? Awesome. Um, that's kind of the end of my jotted down questions on the fly, Amy. Super prepared. Thank you. Uh, Jen, is there anything else that you want to jump in and ask? Yeah, yeah. What are the top three um, things that you would want a medical provider to know about behavioral health and diabetes or chronic um, diseases? Yeah, it, it's such an interesting perspective to think about it from the patient's lens versus the provider's lens. I think that, you know, providers um, I have a great deal of respect for our, our medical colleagues and uh, the rapid pace in which they work. And I, I think one of the things that happens is um, we focus in so much on the physical aspects of diabetes and chronic disease, we sometimes forget those psychosocial aspects. So just recognizing how much, you know, social elements, emotional factors, finances, career, kind of family life, all of these different areas are 
significantly impacted by diabetes and diabetes impacts these areas too. So making sure that we're talking with our patients about some of these challenges and about these areas, how they may be affecting their disease management, and then offering support and connecting them with resources so that they can get support in those areas. Um, so that'd be one, kind of really recognizing those psychosocial factors. Uh, number two, I, I think is just talking a little bit about adherence to medical regimen. So, you know, as providers, we want the best for our patients and we come up with these great care plans. And then we get incredibly frustrated when patients are not following them. And yet when we look at the research on uh, medical adherence or kind of following medical regimen, 50% of people are completely consistent with their medical regimen. So that means over half of the people are not. It's just such a normal phenomenon to struggle, especially when there are multiple aspects to a medical regimen like there are with diabetes. So I think recognizing that this is a very normal phenomenon and what we want to do um, is help our patients to celebrate the areas of success and really build on that and then just troubleshoot um, in a very non-judgmental way and address some of those areas of challenge. Um, and then the third area would really be just making sure that we've got an awareness um, of the higher rates of anxiety and depression among our patients with diabetes and make sure that we're screening for those regularly. You know, depression gets a lot of attention, but anxiety is also an incredibly distressing condition that causes a lot of emotional upset and often ends people up um, in, in the ED with symptoms. So making sure that we're monitoring and assessing for those regularly, because we do see um, more issues with glycemic control. We see poor adherence to medical regimen um, and lower quality of life among people who struggle with both diabetes and some kind of chronic mental health condition like anxiety or depression. So we just want to address that through screening and making sure that we're doing support and getting people connected to resources as soon as possible. So that we can help them improve overall quality of life. Perfect. I, I love kind of the um, comparison there, like you said, Amy, just between the provider and the patient. I think that those are two very different perspectives, all kind of working towards the same goal, but um, can definitely have some varying interpretations of the same information. Is there anything else that you want to say, Amy, just that you want to share and have us include? I just really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you guys today. I think it's one of those areas that people don't always think about. As I mentioned, they think about chronic disease and they think about the physical side and they don't think about the social emotional side. So bringing awareness to that um, is just incredibly value. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you guys today. It's really been fantastic. So thank you. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And thank you for sharing your story. And I guess one, one more thing, if people want to find out more about you, Amy, um, um, where should they track you down? So we um, actually have a website um, that's part of the St. Luke's Health System. So looking up uh, Humphreys Diabetes Center through St. Luke's Health System in Boise, Idaho is a great place to start. All right. We'll be knocking on your door soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks for the opportunity today. Thanks so much for listening. Please find us on social or our website to learn more about what CHU does and how to support with and engage our work. Until next time. Let's all support each other with a little life support.